Matt shared with you our mission statement to help more people more often say what? Yes, yes to God. That the core of the mission statement is that little bitty word, yes. And that yes can change everything about your life. One single yes can dramatically affect the trajectory of your life. I look back to when I was 16 years of age, up behind a church building on a Sunday morning, sitting on a, on a stone wall, aching inside because I knew that I had been a phony Christian my whole life. I knew that I'd gone to church, I believed in God, but I had never surrendered my life to the Lord. And I wrestled back there, and at that point in time, I said, God, I want to give myself to you. I want to, I want to, I want to embrace what you have for me. It was at that point that I said my first big yes to God, and it changed everything about my life. I had an opportunity to go to Arizona years later to work as an intern at a church, to go work with the youth and the children. I said yes and went down to Arizona, and I was hired uh, on staff of the church, worked there for 10 years. It was a life-changing experience, all because I had, had an invitation that I said yes to it. And while I was there, I met a beautiful young woman named Julie, and we began to date, fell in love, and one night in December after a Christmas banquet where I was the guest speaker, uh, we sat in her town or her patio home and just talked, had a wonderful time, and I just looked at her, and uh, I don't know why, I hadn't even planned on doing this, but I just looked at her and said, would you marry me? Now, I know that's not real romantic. I didn't, I didn't plan an event out. I didn't really, you know, it wasn't up on the scoreboard. I didn't get down on a knee. I didn't even open up a little box. I didn't have anything except a question. Will you marry me? And she said yes, and it changed everything. Changed everything. You know, one single yes can change everything about your life. And see, God has a, a beautiful plan for your, your life and for my life, and we are so blessed to have him lay that plan out for us in Scripture. In the Old Testament, we see people, again, saying yes to God, and every time we see Abraham saying yes, we see Noah saying yes, we see these characters saying yes, great things happen. God, God rescues people. God fights great battles for people. God does incredible things, provides miraculously food and bread and all kinds of stuff for people. I mean, God, God does things incredibly on their behalf when they say yes. But then when they turn away from God and say no, and they say yes to the other gods around them, things get real ugly. I mean, they get sick. They wander in deserts. They fall by the wayside. Armies come in and take them captive. We're going to look at a story today, and actually we're going to follow the story for the next three weeks to look at the subject of saying yes to God and what that looks like. And, and how, how do we truly say a strong yes to God? Because what you find in the Old Testament is people often said yes to God, but it just didn't stick. And so we find the Israelites in the time of Nehemiah, and by the way, if you have a Bible, you can open, open up to Nehemiah chapter 1. We, we find the Israelites in a real bad, bad place. They had been captured by the Babylonians drug out of Jerusalem, and in waves of people over a period of 20 years were taken to Babylon as captives. You remember, might remember one of those young men that was taken from Jerusalem over to Babylon. His name was Daniel. Daniel in the lion's den. That, he was one of those captives. And when the Babylonians came into Jerusalem, they not only took them captive, they took all the gold and silver from the temple and they destroyed it. They destroyed the temple. They destroyed the walls around the city. They destroyed it all. Left it in ruins. And so they, they're in Babylon, and while they're there... Of course, nations fight against nations. This is about 605 B.C. Um, Cyrus, king of the Persians, defeats the Babylonians, takes over the whole empire, and he tells the Jews that they can go back home now. In fact, he invites them, go back home, rebuild that temple to your God, and resume worship. So they do. They go back there, and um, if you're reading the Bible reading plan as a church, we've just been in the book of Ezra, and that's the story of Ezra. They go back to Jerusalem, a man that, by the name of Zerubbabel. He, he leads the building project. Now, they hit some hiccups along the way, but it takes about 20, 22 years to get it finally completed and dedicated. And then um, years pass, and a guy named Nehemiah is working in the Persian court. He's a cupbearer to the king. A cupbearer is a very elite position. It's a very trusted position because you serve the king the wine. You, you taste the wine, you make sure it's not poison, and deliver it to the king. So you're, like, you're very high level. And while he's in Persia at the capital, 850 miles away from Jerusalem, some people come back from Jerusalem 
into Susa, the capital city, and Nehemiah says, how are the brothers doing back there? He said, well, they've rebuilt the temple, but the walls are in ruins, and the gates have been burned with fire, and they're in shame, and they're in fear. See, in those days, and you can read about this in ancient literature, cities would build walls around themselves to protect them. For us today, it would be like having a front door. Let's just say you don't have a front door. Your house is wide open. How safe do you feel? People can come in at any time. That's the way the cities were. Here's this beautiful temple, but there's no protection. And armies could come in at any time. People are sleeping at night. People could raid them. They're living in fear, and they're embarrassed because this is God's house. This is God's place. This is where people worship God, and yet we're exposed to the enemies. And it hits Nehemiah like a punch in the gut. And so we, we read this story in Nehemiah chapter 1. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. We're going to look at this character, Nehemiah, for the next three weeks, partly because it illustrates what we're trying to say with this whole subject of saying yes to God. Also because it is the next book we'll be reading in our Bible reading program. If you've not been following along, you might want to do that and just join with us and pick up a reading plan in the foyer so you can follow along. Because it's an incredible story of how God uses this man, how he says yes to God. And he demonstrates in the first story we're going to look at a characteristic that is so critical in saying yes to God, and it is this, that you are yielded, yielded before him. Now, village people had a song they sang, and, and you know, YMCA with a Y. But you know, the letter Y is such a perfect bodily position to demonstrate what it is to be yielded to God. A person that's like this, yielded. If you're going to say yes to God, you've got to be yielded to him. And so when Nehemiah hears this heavy burden, he begins to yield himself to God because he, he goes to his knees in prayer. He weeps, he fasts, he seeks God. And I want to look at this, the example that Nehemiah sets for us as he walks through this journey with the Lord, how he demonstrates saying yes to God. So here's what we learned, first of all, in his prayer that God made the world and has a plan for it. God made the world and has a plan for it. He prays to this great and awesome God. The Lord, the God of heaven. He knows that this world belongs to its maker. God made this world. He made everything and everything on it, everything above it, everything around it. He, he made it. It's his. It belongs to him. And if he made it, surely he has a plan for it. I mean, you look at anything someone has made, the designer has a purpose for it. You want to know how something works? Go to the designer. You want to know how a product works? Go to the person who made it. How's it supposed to work? So wouldn't it make sense to us that if we want to know how things are supposed to work on this earth, we go to the one who made it? It doesn't make sense. God, you made us. You made everything. You know how it works. You know how it's supposed to work. And we get that at church in this kind of environment. But I tell you, once you walk out of this building... You'll find all kinds of people, and maybe you're one of them, who don't live like that. Because here's, here's what we do. I know how it works. I know how to get through this life. I don't need God to do it. And we plow ahead down this path until we get to a place where we realize, uh-oh, I think I've been going down the wrong path. Or we find ourselves in a ditch. And we go, I don't know how to get out of this. And what do we do then? Where do we turn? Well, God. So wouldn't we save a lot of time by just starting there? But we don't, and we're stubborn. We like to plow ahead and do things our own way. And you know, one of the reasons why I think we do that is because we have this fear that God's plan for us isn't a good plan. Why else wouldn't you want it? You must be, there must be some kind of fear, like whatever you have for me is it's not really good. It, it's, it's not what I want. But think about this. When God, when God made the heavens and the earth... He said it was good. And when he made the plants and the, the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and the animals that roamed on the earth, he said, that's good. It's good. 
Then when he made man and woman, he upped it a little bit. He not only said it was good, it was what? Very good. So let me ask you, if, the, if we have a God who's made all this stuff and it's all good and some of it's very good, why in the world would his plan be lousy? Don't you, don't you think his plan for everything he put on this earth would be very good? And shouldn't we be saying, I want to know what that plan is? God, what is that plan? What do you want of my life? But that's not the path that we take. But God knows it all. He's the maker. See, in Isaiah 45, 9, it says this. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him. A pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? I mean, isn't that ridiculous? The clay saying to the maker, you know, what do you do with my life? Because I know exactly what I'm doing with your life. I put you there. I put you on the wheel. I'm shaping you. I'm, I'm forming you. We are like temperamental toddlers trying to argue with our parents. I know what's best for me. <laughs> and we argue with God. And I'm just saying, yield. God, you know what's best. You made this world. You made me. You made it me wonderfully and beautifully. I'll bet your plan for me is wonderful and beautiful. He goes on in his prayer and admits that that's not been their pursuit. He says, We're conf I'm confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we've sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We've acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. People like us have repeatedly strayed from the plan. See, God has a plan. We may even know a lot about the plan, but we consistently stray from the plan. That's why the Israelites had been bumped out of Jerusalem. And it's not like they just goofed up one time. You know, they cry out from e in Egypt, God rescues them. He says, I got this great promised land for you, this great place. When they get to the edge of it and tell them to go in there, they go, oh, we don't want to go in there. There's big people in there. They're, they're frightening. God says, I've been with you. I'll be with you there. Hi, hi, we don't believe that. Okay, you're going to wander for 40 years. In fact, you, you men, you're not even going to get to go in there. When that day comes. And you know, it's, there's this repeated story over and over again of people crying out to God, God rescuing them, and then after a period of time, they just drift right back. And they, they start to look at the gods around them and go, I know God, you saved me, but those other gods look pretty good. Those other gods look pretty nice. I mean, think about this. One of the studies I had this summer was on Solomon. Solomon was the wisest man who ever lived. Surely the wisest man who ever lived would know to trust God. And yet Solomon marries the wives of foreign nations and then begins to worship their gods, even sends up, sets up shrines to those false gods. I think, I think Solomon, you jerk, what are you doing? You, should, you of all people should know better. And yet that's been the pattern of God. And finally God said, okay, I'm done. I'm done. You're going to be scattered among the nations. So they get scattered and they end up in places like Persia. And so he's confessing, you know, my ancestors blew it, I blew it. We've all blown it, God. We've strayed from your commands. One of the things I did while I was on study break was visit some other churches. There's a lot of great churches in our city, different sizes, different flavors, um, just really cool. And one day I went to a church downtown at the 9 o'clock service. And then I went to Costco afterwards to get some stuff because we were going to celebrate my wife's 60th birthday that night. So I know she doesn't look it, does she? So get all, I'm, I'm going to Costco, and I can't believe all the cars at Costco, and I can't believe how busy it is. Am I losing? Yeah. That just dropped quickly. So here I am, I'm in Costco, and I'm, I just said, I said, where'd all these people come from? It's Sunday morning. They're not sleeping in. And I kind of doubt they went to the nine o'clock service like I did. And they don't look like they're dressed for church. And uh, I thought, man, I wonder how God feels about that. And I know I'm gonna, I would hear in the back of my head people's arguments. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, that's true. You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. You don't have to sleep in the same bed as your spouse to be married. 
You don't have to obey your parents' command to do chores to be a child of that family. A lot of things you don't have to do. I don't go to church to be a Christian. I go to church because I'm a Christian. A lot of things we do because of who we are. And I think we're asking the wrong question. So many people say, well, I don't have to do that to be a Christian. I don't have to go to church to be a Christian. I don't have to, to tithe to be a Christian. I don't have to, to sing the songs to be a Christian. I don't... Why are you even asking that? Why, why, why aren't you asking God, God, what do you want me to do? Not, not what are you going to allow me not to do. God, what do you want me to do? You know, when, when I go to sporting events and the national anthem's played, I stand, I put my hand on my heart, I actually sing. That's my choice, and I do it because I'm an American. I don't do it to be an American. I do it because I'm an American. And we, we compromise so much and say, God, oh, I don't have to do that to be a Christian. I don't have to do that. I don't have to be baptized to be a Christian. I don't have to do that, blah, blah, blah. I don't have to do all this stuff. And it's just the wrong kind of question to be asking. We need to be asking, God, what should I be doing? Should I go to church? Should I serve? Should I help that homeless person? Should I, should I be giving? Uh, should I go to the Bible study? Should I be taking that class? That's, that's the kind of question we should be asking. God, what is your will for me in this situation? Not, God, will you allow me to, to slide in if I just do the bare minimum? Come on. You wouldn't do that in your marriage, your family. You say, I do these things because I've, I'm this person. And so Nehemiah recognized the fact that they've fallen way short of the standards of God, and, and he's embarrassed, and he he humbles himself, yields himself, says, God, we've blown it. And then he goes on in, in verse 8. He says, remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, and from there you gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there, they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. He said, God, you made a promise. Promise had two sides. If we don't follow you, you said you would scatter us. And you did. You kept your promise. You also told us this. If we would ever come back, if we'd ever return, your arms would be open to us. And I'm claiming that right now. See, God is a God who keeps the light on. No matter how dark the night is, the, the light is always on. Some of you might remember a song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree. You know, it means it's safe to come home. You're acceptable to me still. It's the story of the prodigal son who, though he shamed his father's name and got involved in some horrendous stuff, came back home. And you remember the posture of the father when the son came running home? Open arms, embraced his son, actually ran out to his son. God is eager to accept you back in when you turn in repentance and come back. You always have to know that. You can, you can count on God for this, no matter how far you've fallen. And some of us have fallen pretty far. Some of you have done some things in, in just recent days that you're just ashamed of. You need to know this. If you turn back to God, his face is kind toward you. You may think he's ready to beat you, shame you. He's not. He's ready to embrace you and bring you in. So what's keeping you back? What's holding you from saying, Father, here I am, yielding to that embrace? God is willing to do that. And not only just to forgive us, he's willing to take us even further. In, in verse 11, Nehemiah closes his prayer by saying this. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the man being the king. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Nehemiah recognized the fact that God had a plan. And though they had strayed from the plan, the door was open to come back, not only to be forgiven, but to be put right back on track with that plan. And so through this time of fasting and praying and being in God's presence, he, he offers us a request to God that he wants to be used by God. And see, here's where, here's where the rub comes. We have to make a choice that either we're going to do our own will, and that's what we're committed to, or we're going to do God's will. Either we come to church, in fact, everyone came here today, you either came with a closed fist or an open hand. Either you came in here saying, oh, I know what I want, and I'm not letting go of any of that. Or you, or you came saying, you know, I'm, 
I want what God has. I came here today because I want what God has for me. You can't have both. See, here's the, look at this picture here. It's like, it's like this. Most of us have an idea of what my plan is. And we invite God to be part of our plan. So we say, God, would you bless my plan? And I'll tell you this about our plans, because they're probably pretty similar. My plan avoids pain and hardship. <laughs> right? I never have a plan. God, I pray that this really hurts. I pray that I really struggle through this. No, my prayer is to avoid all that. <laughs> avoid all of it. God, I pray that I avoid all pain, discomfort, rejection, criticism. I pray that I always win, that I always get picked. I always come out on top. I'm always successful. God, that's my prayer, and would you bless it for your kingdom's sake, Lord? God says, no way. I'm not here to do your will. <laughs> I'm not here like the, the magic fairy to go, oh, that's a nice will. I'll sprinkle some blessing over it. Because I'm creator of this universe. I put you on this planet. I gave you breath. I can take you out if, in a breath. Why aren't you asking me what my will is? See, here's a different kind of a picture God has a plan and invites us into his plan. He says, how about you be part of what I'm doing and have this incredible journey of being part of what I'm doing in this world? Because that's the kind of stuff God says yes to. You see, what Nehemiah does is he comes before God and says, God, I, I pray for your favor before this man, the king. And you may think, well, see, Nehemiah's saying, God, bless my plans, but know this. Nehemiah has just spent weeks in fasting and prayer, saying, God, you need to fix this. Something needs to happen. You gotta, you gotta do something to save your people. And he's praying, 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 and then I think you're wanting me <laughs> to, to initiate it, okay? I'll do it if you give me favor before this king. And if you go into chapter two, he goes before the king and he says, hey, king, would you give me um, time off from work to go help these people who worship a different God than you? And uh, furthermore, would you actually provide the building materials for that and allow me protection, you know, send some guards to protect me on that 850-mile journey to Jerusalem? Would you do that for me? And the king said, I can do that. And God's hand was upon him. Miraculous answers to prayer, but he stepped out in faith. Why? Because here's what happened. His will had morphed into what God's will was. It's like he desired what God desired. See, that's why Jesus could say things like, um, ask whatever you wish, and it'll be given you. This is to my Father's glory. You know, when, you, when your will aligns with him, God says, I'm on. I say yes to you, because you've said yes to me. And that's what we desire. We want to be in that place where God is aligning our will. So let's look at Nehemiah and, and apply it to ourselves. How do we enter into this plan? Well, first of all, Pay attention to the stirring in your heart. Pay attention to this, like a burden, or maybe it's a burning in your heart, this, this weight. God usually doesn't communicate his will and his plan to our heads for us to think about. He stirs something in our heart. Maybe, maybe it's, man, it's like me when I was 16. My life is out of line with God. I need to surrender to him. Maybe it's, you know, I see a lot of homeless people and something needs to be done. I look, or, or I look at the teenagers in our culture and they seem, they seem so hungry for affection and affirmation. I want to be used by God. You know, there's this burden. Maybe the burden is my marriage is in trouble. Marriage is in trouble and something needs to change. Something's happened. It's this weight that doesn't let go and it's just like weighing you down. So what do you do with it? What do you do with that when the burden comes? Well, here's what Nehemiah did. The second thing, take your burden to God. Take it to God. Don't just stew about it. Don't just talk to other people about it. Stop, drop, and pray. Get on your knees. God, why am I so bothered by this? Why is this churning inside of me, this restlessness? Why can't I sleep with this thing um, hanging over me? Why is it? And God's saying, because I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get you to bring it to me so we can talk about it. Get in my presence. Start talking about it. Maybe you need to fast about it. Definitely you need to pray about it. Get into the Lord's presence so he can show you why he's revealing that to you. 
And then the third thing Nehemiah did, offer yourself to do his will. Be ready to say yes to him. God is looking, the scripture says, all over this earth to find men and women willing to go where he leads them. Willing to trust him to do great things. We see this in the man named Nehemiah, excuse me, Isaiah in the Old Testament. Isaiah sees this vision of, a, of the Lord high and lifted up and he's, he's humbled by it and he's, he, he feels so ashamed of himself and his own sin and God forgives him of his sin. And then the angel says, uh, he's, the angel speaks to him. Isaiah says it this way, I heard a voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for me? And here's Isaiah's response. Here I am. Send those guys. No, 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 no. Here I am. Send, send me. God, I think the reason you've got my attention is you want me to be the one. So send me. You know, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, his will was to go around pain and hardship. I don't want to go to that cross. I don't want to go that route, but not my will. Yours be done. Surrendered to God's will. So Romans chapter 12, verse 1, tells us as believers, present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Present. What does it mean? Yield. Offer yourself. Say, here I am. Use me. Use me. God wants to use you. He wants you to be offered to him. The other day, um, I went on a retreat on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Kind of lost my voice at this men's retreat. Now, this retreat is called the crucible. Now, you, you know what a crucible is. That's where something gets crushed. And someone reminded me, yeah, I think the crucible is the name of the, the, like the final leg of the testing for the Navy SEALs. I don't know if that's true. Or, and I said, oh, great. Because in the advertisement for this retreat, it says this will push you physically, intellectually, emotionally, and spiritually. So they give us a list of questions to review before we go on this, this retreat. And the questions are like this. What do others not know about you? What I struggle to accept about me and my life is blank. What wounds do I carry as a man? What wounds do I carry from my father? How have these wounds impacted my life? What's missing in my life? Where, where, where do I want to experience breakthroughs? Where in my life am I being held back and playing it safe? Top of all this, they said, and bring a set of clothes that can be destroyed. <laughs> okay, I'm, uh, I'm a little nervous. But what's going to happen at this retreat? What's going to re require of me? But you know, I have a friend who four years ago went on this retreat says the best thing he's ever done. He says, I think you'll like it when you get through it. And I did. It was a great retreat. Best men's retreat I've ever been to. And what I've discovered is that God's best is on the other side of yes. God's best is on the other side of yes. He's got a plan. Beautiful plan for your life. You need to know that about God. He's a beautiful, wonderful, powerful, good God. And he's got this great plan for you, and yet you get to the edge, and God says, okay, take a step. Take a step across this line. Take a step into this dark area. Take a step where I'm leading you. And you stand here pausing, saying, maybe not now, maybe not today, maybe someday later. And God's, and God's whispering, but my best is on the other side of yes. If you just have the courage to say yes, it would change everything. And God has taken you to the edge of a yes. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And he's been giving you a burden. He's been speaking to you. It might be about your marriage. It might be about, about your career. It might be about your own soul. It might be about an issue that God's been trying to get you to step forward in faith for a long, long time. And Just know this. If you could just say yes, it would open up all kinds of new things, good things in your life.